Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we have an amazing guest that is going to talk to us about the strategies of scaling and the changing landscape of Amazon and how we're all going to fit and scale our businesses into everything that's shifting and changing because we all want to scale and grow, don't we? And so welcome, please, Jason, to the show. Jason Somerville, he is the founding one of the founding members of GW Partners and can you just tell us what you do there so that I don't botch your your bio sure. or anything <laughs> yeah well thanks Kristen glad to be here um yeah I would say in, in it I'll, I'll give the short version so the short version is we help companies really strategically plan for typically some sort of event in the future a lot of times that's a sale sometimes it's a strategic partnership so, but what we do is we work with founders and, and we help them understand where their business is going, where it could go, help them put together a plan to execute, uh, and then actually, you know, kind of come alongside and help execute on that plan as well. So we're a little bit unique in that way. I think a lot of times you'll find, you know, agencies and consultants and even, you know, bankers and brokers who kind of do different little parts and pieces of all that stuff. Um, we're kind of the only firm that really puts it all together. So, and we, we, we chose to go that route um, after a few years and understanding, well, what, what do we think we can do that's of most value and what mm -hmm. is most, most fulfilling to us? And I think, you know, as we were chatting a little before we hopped on uh, the camera here, what's really fulfilling is, is, you know, kind of participating in uh, someone else's success, especially founders. So, we love to, again, come alongside, add a lot of value, hopefully help really get, you know, the focus on a great strategic plan, execute, and then maybe it just keeps going forever and ever and the business just grows and is successful and but or maybe it ultimately sells. So that's in a nutshell what we do. So we're, we're advisors and partners. That's awesome. And I love that you guys have like such a, a wide range of, of things that you offer rather than just acquisitions or just selling or just like, oh, we only handle this part. You kind of take people in and, and, and do kind of assessments of like, where are you now? Where would you like to go? Where is the current standing? And it's either this direction or this direction. It's not always a sale. Sometimes it's like you said, partnerships or, you know, moving on. So that's amazing. Well, how did you get started in this? Are you an entrepreneur yourself? I am. Yeah. I, um, so I started like a lot of people, I, I had a regular sort of corporate career. I, um, I was an investment banker at bank of America right out of college. So, um, and then I went and ran capital markets at a large hedge fund in Miami, uh, called Bayview asset management. So the first 10 years, um, of my life was building my skills as a, as a banker, as a finance expert, you know, as kind of a deal maker. And then I decided, okay, yeah, I've had a lot of this. If, if anyone knows much about that industry, it's 100-hour weeks, it's hardcore pressure, it's working with the biggest companies in the world, and obviously a, a very high level of expectation. So decided, you know what, I think I'd like to go the entrepreneurial route. You know, I had a lot of things I wanted to do, felt like I could hopefully handle the pressure, handle the risks, and understand them. So after a little sabbatical, I, I kind of started, you know, looking at different opportunities to either start companies or acquire them. And, and I did that um, for about mm, five, six years uh, before we kind of went down this road. Now, I still am an entrepreneur in many ways, and, and this firm is one of those. Um, but like during my original time of converting, you know, participated in a lot of different industries, everything from mining to construction to consulting to you know aviation you know all kinds of different hmm. stuff yeah that's and, quite uh, the swing of, of different things there i'm like huh let's pump the brakes there for a second you said mining and aviation like i'm interested um how do you go from being a corporate investment banker to then dabbling in mining <laughs> Well, it's interesting. The um, so th there's a really good skill set that that kind of world will build. Like the the kind of it helps you really understand how to break a company down, how to see opportunities within an industry or a particular company's business. Because a lot of times, what you're doing, and it's a lot of what we still do today, you're trying to explain all of that to you know some audience. That audience might be an investor, might be an acquirer, it could be a lender, it could be all sorts of. But that's like the DNA of what you're doing is breaking it down, understanding it, and then sort of seeing the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can apply that to almost any business, right? That skill set. So 
that's why I didn't shy away or felt like I needed to necessarily only pay, you know, attention to one sector. Um, the mining thing was interesting. It's, you know, got involved actually through uh, buying up shares on Toronto Stock Exchange of this Panamanian gold mine where some friends and I bought enough shares where we were starting to have real influence in it. And so, you know, went down to Panama, kind of got involved and then, you know, went from there. And that's that was the mining thing. And that was about a year and a half or so little venture. Um, and then aviation was I, I became a helicopter pilot when I had some free time and uh, started leasing uh, helicopters to flight schools. So, again, similar kind of you're looking at it like, OK, let me understand this industry. Let me understand this market. Can I see the future? OK, cool. There's an opportunity and then seizing it. Hmm. So all of those years of learning that, learning the risk assessment and look, learning at, you know, learning the, the business opportunities and the looking at, hey, this is really has some potential, you know, using those hundred hours a week that you were putting in. And then you lost right. me there. I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, and so when, you know, coming to entrepreneurship and, and talking through, you know, your journey there, um, what what about what are your thoughts about e-commerce and how that has started and then evolved in the last couple of decades? I mean, well, it's interesting. So I blame my partner, Chris, for uh, me being in e-commerce. Um, you know, he so it was weird. Like so we, we started working together a little over six years ago. He was he was actually consulting companies on getting onto Amazon. He spent his career in baby products and he actually got hired, as he would say, talking to the buyers at Toys R Us, Babies R Us, Bye Bye Baby. He wanted to start talking directly to, to the consumer. He did that and then started helping young brands learn to sell on Amazon. Um, around the same time, you know, after I had, you know, exited a, a couple of companies and I had decided, you know what, I really like this idea of helping others do what I just did helping others plan for and ultimately, you know, maybe have a, have a, a an exit opportunity. Um, he and I met by happenstance. Um, we ended up, I ended up selling his father-in-law's direct to consumer e-commerce stroller business. And, you know, it kind of went from there. I dove into e-commerce much, much deeper at that point. Um, understood it, you know, kind of used those same skills we talked about before dove in. And, and it's been interesting, of course, like the big themes, everybody knows, look, online shopping, growing steadily, right, for 20 years. And then we obviously had the pandemic, put it into hyperdrive, but then it's kind of reverted back to the mean in terms of the growth rate. And I mean, I think that that what I saw from a from a fundamental standpoint is this chart is going up and to the right. It's just a matter of how steep is the chart going to look? I mean, the, the, the market share moving online and e-commerce is it's only going to grow. And I don't see it stopping. I could see it slowing, but I definitely couldn't see it stopping. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that there's some fundamental um, conveniences that we all really appreciate about it, right? I mean, just the fundamentals of being able to actually, you know, it's infinite shelf space, right, from your mm -hmm. computer screen. I can access and review and look and, you know, all of that at so many things that if I'm physically walking through a shopping mall or a mass retailer, it's just you can't even come close to duplicating that level of efficiency mm -hmm. and convenience. So I think yeah. and, and once everybody got through the safety aspect, like feeling like it was secure, I feel like that was one of the big barriers. I absolutely agree. I mean, I would say generations past, particularly my father was one of those that was so terrified of his credit card being online and there's so much fraud. And like before he passed away, he was still very antiquated when it came to that. We're like, we are in the 21st century. It's OK to put your credit card online. He's like, no, it's not. And, like, you know, certain things. So I know we've kind of overcome a lot of those um, those things. And of course, like you said, the trust factor, the secure factor is really, really important, which I think what that made Amazon so successful so early on is because people learned to trust the fact that they were going to deliver, they were going to deliver on time, and they were going to provide what most people, including big retailers like Walmart or Target or any of those stuff, was not providing, which was the variety. Like you could not mm -hmm. only shop for patio furniture, you could see every piece of patio furniture from anywhere that was being manufactured if it was listed on Amazon. So you don't just get to shop at whatever is at Home Depot down the road, but you actually can look at 
25 to 50 different varieties, which no physical store could actually hold. So I know the beauty of that is, and even now in, in this, you know, in 2023, um, time is money. And when someone can mm -hmm. save you time, you know how much money that's putting back in your pocket. You don't have to get down, go to the store, get what you want, hopefully find what you want and come back. Um, someone else can deliver that and do that for you in a couple of minutes so that you can move on with your real life. And so I think that's why it's still continuing to grow and change. But then the, the landscape is changing because then we've got things like, um, you know, we've got some bad players. We've got some copycats. We've got copyright infringement. We've got um, all kinds of different rules and regulations and platforms and um so what do you what do you feel like now with the strategies for scaling? Let's just I mean, we specifically talk about Amazon here on the Amazon files. Sure. I mean, there's plenty of other e-commerce things we could you know discuss in other places. But with Amazon, knowing it's the biggest global online marketplace, um, you know, we know that most people, if not everyone, has heard of Amazon and uses it and is usually a Prime member. Um, so when it comes to scaling in that respect, what have you seen has been working post pandemic? Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is obviously going to be specific to a certain, you know, product category or, or a different strategy. As we said, we talked a little bit about, you know, the strategy that you, you've taught people on bundling or is it private label? Are you reselling? I think there's some different answers to, depending on where you're playing. But I think there's some common elements, too. I mean, first of all, I think what we've seen is am the Amazon environment has gotten more competitive and more expensive for people looking to sell products on Amazon. Right. So I think one is understanding that and understanding that, you know, the, it's likely, likely, not always going to cost you kind of more and more to acquire a customer. Right. To acquire a customer's eyeballs. So what. So that means conver conversion becomes even more important than it ever was before, right? Because you're like, well, listen, you know, I, if I'm, I'm, most people, including the biggest companies, have some level of capital constraints. Like you can't just pour money into a hole forever and then eventually it'll work out. Like that's not typically, especially with small businesses, especially with, um, you know, especially businesses that are more like even side hustle type businesses. So you can't do that. So so conversion becomes incredibly important. I think, you know, focusing on conversion and making sure that you're fully optimized for conversion uh, is huge in scaling because you're, you're going to be probably acquiring less eyeballs for the same amount of investment. I think the other thing is what we've kind of seen a lot is that unfortunately, with some exceptions, um, things tend to have these shelf lives at, on Amazon and that they seem to be getting a, shorter and kind of shorter. So what that means is if you have a great SKU or a great product, you, you obviously need to try and maximize that. But you need to already plan that at some point you're going to crest, you're going to start to come down and you need to have that next thing right behind it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I call we call it sort of stacking opportunities. And that's a difficult, it's not an easy thing to do because you don't want to bail on a great uh, SKU or great product too soon, but it also you want to be always ready with that next, like in, use a stupid baseball analogy. There should be pitchers warming up in the bullpen for when your guy on the mound is starting to run out of steam and his arms getting tired, you need to be able to put the next guy in. And so I think that has become incredible. And whether, regardless of, of strategy, regardless of, again, your private label reseller, going bundles, whatever, that's another very critical component right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's only going to get more so. I just think Amazon, regardless of what happens with the lawsuit from the government, I don't, I don't know that it's going to get less competitive. Well, and it's also, um, I think that really plays into the culture in which we live, at least, you know, when I say culture, I'm talking about 21st century America, where we are right now, and, and what's going on in that pace. And I don't know, uh, I know with you, you, we've talked off air, and you have some children. Um, but you know, anyone in that age where they have smartphones, and there's things like Timu that's coming out that they, they're like producing and copying all the other different products and re re reaching more directly to consumer. Um, but what we also see is those chef lives becoming shorter and shorter because of influencers and because of things like TikTok, to where you can see something 
something absolutely balloon for two, three, four weeks and get viral and everyone wants to buy one. And then by the time they actually, that package arrives from wherever they bought it from, they're on to the next thing. They're looking at the next thing. Like things, trends last so much, they are so much shorter than they ever used to be to where, you know, if, if you fa fast, you know, rewind back to the eighties and, you know, there was cabbage patch dolls that were like all the rage for a time. And they were that way for like nearly a decade to where now you're lucky if you get six weeks on any sort of thing that's trending right and so mm -hmm. it's always um and i've always looked at at focusing in the market on things that are have proven longevity and and some commodity kind of base type things where where you're not always mm -hmm. just jumping on the new train to, to get the new product there um now let's let's shift to talking a little bit about market share because we are on Amazon, but as the competition is getting more and more, and the it's getting I mean let's be real we know it's more expensive now. I mean I know that I started Amazon in two thousand eight, and now mm -hmm. the, when I first started the fees that I paid were eighteen percent at that point eighteen percent of all I mean it was literally felt like the Midas touch at that point. Now we're mm -hmm. up to thirty three percent fees, so that's even in less in like. You know about what how many i don't know how many years it's been now i can't even do the math about 15. Um, yeah so uh, in about that amount of time we have almost doubled those fees over time as competition comes in as the company itself grows then other people are going and they have more fees and now it's going to be about advertising rather than just having a really good product and having variety was enough mm -hmm. 10 years ago now it's not enough you can have the best product in the world with the highest quality but if you can't compete on price or you can't compete on on um, pp see, then you're not going to be seen by all those people. So what are your thoughts right now about um, increasing market share so that you have more eyeballs on your your amazing products? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, I mean, and this isn't a new thing, but again, it's almost like with the conversion becoming more important on this, I think understanding, you know, ranking is, is even more important now and understanding organic ranking is even more important now. I think that you know, and, and granted, it's gotten harder, but I'd say what we see where people get, I think, you know, especially on a little bit of a smaller scale where people get, you know, pretty good trends is in finding the niches, right? Finding the, the, the pieces of white space and then continuing to look for that next piece of white space. I think that depending on the category, right, um, the ability to increase market share is just going to be a little bit of a different challenge, right? Some it's a little bit easier, some it's a little bit harder. But I think what, what I would say is even more important than trying to grow market share is trying to find niches, right? I mm. think that that is even more important because what we have seen is the, the most, like the, the products in the categories that have the biggest share and the big and lots and lots of traffic Unfortunately, that's where usually the margin just gets squeezed out of them so quickly, right? So yeah. if it's a little bit of a race to the bottom a lot of times to try to chase market share in, in a larger category, even though there's it's that can be a little bit counterintuitive because you're like, well, wait a minute, bigger market, bigger opportunity. If I have, you know, 0.1% of this giant market or I have 10% of this smaller market, like the 0.1% of the giant market feels great, except for the fact that there's a good chance that even that market share you're acquiring, especially the marginal market share, what I'll say that next you know, piece, it's hard for that profitability to be there. So I think a lot of people, sometimes it's just don't have the data to understand it, maybe also aren't thinking about it that way. It's like, okay, well, what is that marginal cost of the next, you know, step up in market share? And I think what we're seeing is for many, many, many companies, it's not, it's not worth it, right? In larger categories. So it's like try to find niches and grow market share in niches, which is a lot easier, but it's just a smaller yeah. overall opportunity. Smaller overall, yet still global. <laughs> so that's right. the, that's what I think. That's what I love about uh, about this, about having online business and having a product, and specifically when it comes to the larger markets versus the smaller, you know, niche opportunities, is that you might be serving a lot less people, but a lot less people are serving those people. So you're not, you know, it's right. like a big fish in a small pond. <laughs> you know, you want to exactly. be the big fish in the small pond rather than you're in the ocean and you still are a big fish. You're still in the ocean, <laughs> and so if you're if you're the bigger fish in the smaller pond, you have 
a bigger and greater opportunity to not only gain the eyeballs of your customers, but then also keep them around, um, specifically when it comes to solving problems for people. And that's one of the reasons, that's what right. I'm always advocating for, for, for my clients to create products and create bundles that meet a need and solve a problem for, for their customers. No matter how small that need is or that niche is, if you are serving people with something that solves their problem or meet their needs, they will come back for more. <laughs> they will continue yep. to come back. Whether you sell iPhone cases or HDMI cords or tarps, you are solving a problem. And if you solve it in a better, more efficient way, or even in a variety that someone else isn't solving, then you mm -hmm. get to own that corner of the market. Um, so in Absolutely. your in your buying and selling and acquiring and merging all these different companies and exiting them, um, what are you what are you foreseeing right now as um, like the biggest the biggest advantage of building a company and building a brand uh, like an e commerce brand or or something like that? Do you do you feel like most people have the goal to sell or do they have the goal to to grow and expand and be you know some household name? Well, I think, especially in the Amazon world, I think prior to this big kind of pandemic, plus we had the whole aggregator boom thing in, in Amazon, it was really less about selling. You know, we, we've been working with uh, people, um, you know, who, who were Amazon native or heavy users of Amazon as their distribution channel for a while, pre-pandemic, pre-aggregator, boom, all of that. And it was much more the mindset before of, hey, I just want to grow a business that, you know, cash flows, that I feel like, you know, is worth my time, that I feel passionate about. I feel like I'm good at, you know, products that I really like or that I just feel like I've found something here that's a little bit different. Um, and I think we're seeing people get back to that mindset a little bit because, you know, the truth of the matter is, and, and not to kind of re, you know, go back through the what happened over 2020, 2021, and early 22, but there was a pretty big, you know, rush on buying Amazon native businesses. Um, and that's now kind of stopped. And so I would say that, you know, what, what one of the things we're doing with a lot of, of, of sellers is they're coming to us and saying, hey, well, do you think this is something I can build into a very sellable company? Right. And I think the answer for many is like, you know what, I feel like the better choice is to try to grow your business and cash flow your business so that it supports your life, maybe provides additional capital to invest in the next thing or whatever, and not be so worried about selling because the truth of the matter is, it's going to be difficult you know, to, to sell companies that are 100% Amazon, not impossible, but more difficult, right, in the future. And I think that what can happen is, especially when it comes from a, like a capital investment and a cash flow standpoint is, if you're really just trying to grow to sell, but you're not going to ultimately get there to create a very sellable, attractive company, you probably probably would have done it differently along the way. You probably would have been able to generate more cash for you individually. You could have done some other things, which, which have just been a better use of your time and energy. So I think we're seeing it shift back a little bit, interestingly enough. And, and I think that's actually a good thing. Mm. Um, I think that it, it's, just more, it's just really important that, you know, when you're going somewhere, you know where you're going, right? Mm. You're not just driving into some unknown destination. And I think that understanding, hey, what does it look like to create a business that someone's going to want to pay a lot of money for or a high multiple for mm -hmm. versus what does it look like? Hey, you know what? This may not be ultimately that, but you know what it is? It's a great business. Mm -hmm. It cash flows like a champ. It funds my lifestyle, my retirement income. And ultimately, maybe I'm going to reinvest those funds into another e-commerce business or real estate or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to understand the likely path and then plan accordingly. I love that perspective on that because for so many years, I feel like it was drilled into my head to be like, build sellable assets, build sellable companies, build all this stuff. And I have definitely been doing that with both of my companies moving forward towards that. But I, but knowing that I do have a couple of profitable cash flow businesses, I love the perspective of that because that's exactly what we do with one. It is like just, hey, this is how we keep the lights on and pay the mortgage and all that. But the other, mm -hmm is one that we actually take the cash from it it's it's a uh 
mostly outsourced. So although I'm the the CEO, founder, and you know head person in charge here, everything else is really outsourced, and I receive that cash flow that then is invested into other businesses. So um, mm -hmm. I, I never really you know you put it greatly in words, and I just didn't, didn't really think about that as a whole. But the goal of that really is to keep the cash flowing and keep the thing you know keep new new things coming in so that we have this this cash flow. But the goal there isn't really to just like grow, grow, grow to sell. It's more like the more cash we produce over here, the more we're investing in other places. Um, so that right. is building up the the kind of what I, I just some I, I don't use all the fancy words y'all do. I'm just like it's free money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the free money Smell. is going in here to earn me money and investments and, right. and other things. So um exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's funny. It, it's it's not the most popular topic, right? I, I think at the cocktail party with a bunch of Amazon sellers, <laughs> it's just sexier to talk about how, hey man, I'm I'm gonna build this company, I'm gonna sell it for a big number one day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and and yeah, that's great. I think there's a portion of, of that that makes sense. And then I think there's a big, you know, a, a, honestly, a bigger portion where it says, actually, you know what, that'll be great if that happens, you know, at some point, but I'm really going to focus on this as as being, you know, a, a cash flowing venture. Hmm. And, you know, I'm going to think really hard about inventory management because so much of Amazon sellers capital, almost, you know, overwhelming majority of what's in the business is sitting in inventory. Hmm. So efficiency on inventory is the biggest driver um, of, of cash flow, right? And obviously, you know, and then being you know, really efficient on my ad spend because going back to that marginal analysis, which a lot of people don't do, it's like, okay, well, I, to get to again to get to 500,000 in sales it costs me on average say 10% of revenue in marketing costs mm -hmm. well let's say to get to a you know 700,000 in sales it's going to cost me i got to go up to 20% mm -hmm. so they but they look at it as 20% of 700 not as the you know the basically the the math divided by the extra 200 mm -hmm. thousand of revenue and they say well, well the marginal so it's like oh well that 70 grand of extra marketing cost actually only got me 200 grand of extra revenue. So my marginal cost is actually 40, hmm. right? And you're like, oh, okay, well, wait a minute. Is that really worth it? Like, is that pro is that next 200,000 of revenue actually profitable? It's right. Like, mm, maybe not. I'm actually losing my, so yeah. let's don't do that. <laughs> I think a lot of people too, they, they don't, especially people that are are newer and they're just trying to figure out the nuances of business and inventory and get everything in there that, that they don't number one i feel like people are so afraid to spend the money to make the money so there's like right. a first mistake right there is it like name me a company that doesn't advertise in some sort of form in some form whether it's just free social media and they're blowing that up or tv commercials i mean i used i always joke about it because pre-pandemic like we i've used zoom before it was cool you know what i mean before they were on everybody's everything um but then after that was just it was like this is was the platform uh, and even now we see tools like slack being advertised on and normal national tv things like that like business solutions and stuff so it's like name mm -hmm. me a company that doesn't advertise once you get a, sol a solidified brand and you have something you're standing behind and you're moving forward with that advertising is the next natural step but you can ever advertise yourself into a hole if you don't pay attention right. to your return on your ad spend or you return on hey if i am selling a hundred dollar product and i'm spending ten dollars to acquire that hundred versus like you said all of a sudden you you're, you're the next step of that might be spending forty dollars to acquire the hundred dollars and that's your forty percent and so um you have to decide at what point what that is what it's worth to you to do that is it just extra time is it extra money and would you spend this to make this right exactly so if you're trying to cash flow those kinds of things are, are super important right and i think there's a difference like if you're trying to grow and you have a plan of hey i want to sell my company in two years and i know in order to do that i need to grow it let's say two or three times as large on the revenue front right as i am right now um for for many reasons again it's much more nuanced than that but you know you're going to make some different decisions than if you're saying, hey, well, you know what I really want to do? I want to put as much money in my pocket over the next two years as I can. Um, and so that's how I'm looking at the world. 
Um, maybe that's because I'm growing. Maybe it's also just because I'm getting more efficient. Maybe it's because I'm actually negotiating better with my suppliers and I'm getting lower cost of goods, whatever it is, right? That's a, again, a, there's a lot of crossover in kind of the Venn diagram, but there's also a lot of differences there. And so knowing which one you are and which one you want to be is huge to then making those decisions about how to move forward uh, and build and, and run your business. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. I think it really all circles back to like what we even talked about in the very beginning is is like, where are you going? Where are you steering your ship? And if you don't know that, y'all, you need to press pause on this podcast right now and take a 15 minute hustle with a piece of paper or your phone and just literally figure out where you want to go and where you want to do. And this is going to be a shameless plug for my book, of course, because people that are struggling <laughs> with knowing what they want, um, Dream Big, Step Small gives you in chapter three, if you read nothing other than chapter three, it will give you a roadmap to figure out what your in a perfect world is. We know there's no such thing as a perfect mm -hmm. world, but if you could create one and then take steps towards that perfect world for you, what does that look like for you? If you don't know how to do that or you haven't done that, I give you the guidebook in there so that you can, you you can actually figure out where you're going because if you don't know then how are you going to steer your business in that direction if you don't know that you want to eventually sell or you eventually just want this or maybe your goal is to quit your nine to five and this is a side hustle well then you need to figure out how to make that cash and make it sustainable so that you can leave the nine to five behind and really run your business in a way that you know makes you feel fulfilled but also um generates the cash flow because inventory management will make you cash poor in a hurry if you don't know how to manage that and move those assets around okay that's so right i appreciate all of your insight here all of your um you know just a lot of the wisdom that you're giving us here and thinking about how to steer our ship and in which way and um how about generating all of the cash flow that you need to kind of sustain your lifestyle if that's what you want to do or to build it for sale um if someone wants to get in touch with you about maybe growing their business and selling it or growing it for cash flow purposes how are they going to reach out to you and and your team yeah, best place to go to our website. It's actually gw.partners. So, you know, you don't need to put a dot com on the end, just gw. or J jason at gw.partners. You can email me directly there and uh, we we'll, would love to have a chat with anybody. We love talking to entrepreneurs. You know, that's what and we live for. What can they expect when they first contact you? Is there like an onboarding form where you guys just have like a face to face conversation? How does that look? Yeah, usually we start with like an introduction discussion, you know, it's a face to face, you know, typically 30 minutes or so just, hey, you know, let's, let's get to know each other a little bit, understand about what, what, you know, what your business is, you know, where do you think you want to go with it? Um, and then, you know, after that, it's after that kind of, we call it a productive get to know you kind of a discussion. Um, if it seems like it might make sense to work together, uh, we then usually move on to, you know, asking for information and, you know, putting NDAs in place and all that and, and doing some essentially analysis on our side to, to kind of really figure out, all right, this is where we can be of help, right? Mm -hmm. These are the areas where we believe we can, you know, provide that founder with some, you know, real strategic value. Uh, and then what we always try to do, to be honest, if it seems like it's not a fit to work together with someone, we still try to be a great resource network for people. We love we, we love connecting like, hey, you know what? I really need somebody that can help me with, you know, my compliance audit. Like, mm -hmm. OK, cool. We got that. We got you covered. Let me we'll put you in touch with, you know, this person or this company. Um, that's something else we really try hard to, to do as well, even if we're not going to work together directly. Awesome. I appreciate that so much. And thank you so much for your time and your energy. I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing and I don't take that for granted. So thank you for um, joining us on the Amazon Files podcast. Guys, you know where to find me and when to find me. Please make sure you subscribe and listen and share this episode with other people. Don't forget to reach out to Jason and his team at GW.partners and we'll see you guys same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you.